Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. And uh, first, a couple of things. So, you know, our director, we are going to all to brainstorm the Kaplan's, which is the old library. So, if you might advise your hand just to count the numbers and then we can call the bar just in case. So, please come in. <laughs> Services in the UK and wants to become a member, Maria Jimenez, who is there. She can I give you uh, a registration form. So let's start. And uh, let me introduce you today Dr. Mike Ellsworth, which is the program director of scientists for the uh, European Union. Uh, he's working as an independent consultant in research and innovation policy, and is also a visiting researcher at school, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has been previously been working at UCL and the Royal College of Anesthetics. He's not the test. It's quite difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even for some anesthetists. Okay. So his undergrad uh, was in Cambridge in Natural Sciences and the PhD in King's College London in behavior genetics. So now his current work includes a series of case studies on international innovation by three universities for the universities in UK, and an analysis to assess the effectiveness of the EU's health research program under the framework program seven. So his commentary on UK EU research relation has been cited in recent government and House of Lords documents and has analyzed and written commentary on EU research programs since 2009. And has given invited talks on science policy and been a vocal on why the UK should stay in the EU for science since 2013. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right, can, can you all hear me nicely and clearly? Absolutely. Yes. Good, great. So um, this is called Scientists versus Eurosceptics, making the, making the presumption that there are no scientists who are Eurosceptics. But anyway, is, is that. It's a, it's a nice shorthand, that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and um, I, there, was, there was someone online who said, I hope it's going to be you know, a fair and well-balanced debate. Well, you know, uh, no, it's, it's not a debate, it's going to be pretty one-sided. <laughs> um, um, but one of the important things is that uh, now that the, the referendum is on, there, there needs to be even amongst those people who are pro-EU, and they know generally why they're pro-EU, we do need to, to shape up all of the arguments and get out to the public who don't understand um, our viewpoint and, and our understanding what that's all about. So, what I'm going to talk about specifically is scientists for EU, who we are, because we're very new on the scene, 
Um, then I want to uh, go on to analyzing the EU science programs and, and what I've learned from that and how it's changed over time, importantly. Then come on to the, the main meat of it, why UK science needs the EU, uh, why it can't do without it, um, or not very effectively. Um, what would happen in the case of the Brexit, um, were that to be the way people vote? The Eurosceptic damage already done, and believe me, there is some, so we'll go into some of that. Um, and then finally at the end, um, I'll, I'll show you uh, a few uh, tweets and Facebook comments from a few trolls we've had visiting, because that's entertaining stroke shocking. All right, so it's been known, well, it's, it's been argued for a while, uh, the importance of the EU to um, British research and innovation in science. This here is Sir Paul Nurse, our current president of the Royal Society, and he wrote uh, back in, in uh, January 2013, um, Science funding in the EU, you've got to be in it to win it. The benefits to UK research um, are, argue strongly for continued EU membership. And this was shared nine times in the Guardian. So no one really cared before. And then something happened, and that was our bacon was saved, according to the Sun, and we had David Cameron come back in again, so there we go, look at that, look, blue steel, brilliant. Um, but that meant, because he had an election pledge, um, that we are now set up for a referendum on EU membership by the end of 2017. Now, as soon as the election happened, the day after, on May the 8th, um, there were, we were having a conversation um, within um, the we were having a conversation within the Executive Committee of Scientists for Labour, which I'm part of, and we said, right, okay, so clearly the issue now is the referendum, because um, Europe, we all know that the European um, Union is, is absolutely vital to the work we do, but this isn't understood by many people, and there aren't a lot of channels for scientists to express what it's done. So um, myself and Rob Davidson decided to set up um, scientists for EU on Facebook and on Twitter to try and make that a social media presence and um, that weekend it was just growing by thousands of people um, lots of scientists were sharing with their friends on Twitter um, lots of scientists were telling all of their followers to follow scientists for EU um, because the name sold itself uh, to a lot of people it also prompted media interest, and so I got calls for interviews or invitations to write articles. Um, and one of those was um, an invitation by the science correspondent of the Times, um, Oliver Moody, to write a letter to the editor of the Times, and he said, see if you can get some big names behind it as well. So we did that. Um, we wrote um, a letter to the Times and um, using our contacts and using help from universities UK who are strongly pro-EU and who we'd been in touch with and, and who I worked with, uh, we got the co-signatories of um, uh, Martin Rees, so that's um, Lord Rees of Ludlow, who is our Astronomer Royal at the moment, and ex-president of the Royal Society, is based here at Cambridge, similarly with Professor Sir Tom Blundell, President of the Science Council and entrepreneur, uh, Sir Paul Nurse, current head of the Royal Society, signing in personal capacity, um, Andrea Giroli, who is um, the chief editor of Nature Physics, now Sir Philip Campbell, editor in chief of Nature as a whole, Professor Sir Steve Smith, Vice Chancellor of Exeter, Professor Sir Ian Diamond, um, uh, Vice Chancellor of Aberdeen and uh, Professor Donald, who's also here in Cambridge. And so this, this was then circulated on social media. It was cited on, on um, BBC Radio 4 by Lord Patton, and it was our first kind of like stamp in the wider media of we can connect um, the science community with the science leadership, all feeling strongly about this issue. And we were saying that it is not sufficiently known to the public 
that the EU is a boon to UK science and innovation, the freedom of movement for talent and ambitious EU science funding programmes which support vital complex international collaborations put the UK in a world leading position. And this then goes on to benefit our, our economy hugely. So since that letter, which came out at, at the end of May, we have been busy getting our campaign involved in the main overall campaign because we believe science to be a very important part of it. Um, so we have been building links with the other pro-EU campaigns that are coalescing into this thing which, which is called the Yes campaign, which hasn't had its formal launch yet, um, although it does have um, it, its leader now, who is Will Straw, and that's Jack Straw's son, if you know, both of them are politicians. So there's Universities UK that have come out strongly as pro-Europe, they've got their own campaign going, we're working very closely with them. There's European movement um, and young European movement, and so you guys should watch out for Universities UK and young European movement because they'll be wanting to collaboratively organise lots of talks and debates in universities. Um, young European movement is, is for kind of like under 35, so, so the student population, and Universities UK is the sort of top down uh, through the leadership of the universities on that. British influence, uh, pro Europa, which are actually based in Europe, the Lady Yes campaign, and business for New Europe. So there's, there's lots of different pro-EU campaigns which are now coming together in order to present this multifaceted set of reasons for why we should stay in the EU. So harnessing all the different communities that understand the importance of the EU to our economy and also our quality of life. Um, and I've also gone around meeting with a lot of science bodies such as Case, the Royal Society, Royal Astronomical Society, Science is Vital, um, Science Ground, they, those two work very closely together, the British Science Association, Institute of Chemical Engineers, and also I've uh, talked a lot to Swiss Corps about the, the Swiss situation, which we'll come on to later. And in terms of output, we've been really busy as well. We've been um, busy um, uh, writing articles, doing interviews, and also being cited in lots of places. And so we've already popped up in the Guardian, the Times, Research of Science Business, uh, two editorials in uh, Nature, Materials and Nature and Technology, Time to Higher Education, London School of Economics Bob. So we're, so we're really trying to get some output there. And also, um, I've been shaping up the, um, the advisory board. Um, and so it's been very important to one, like I was saying before, have that big social media drive so that we can share information there with the whole community of everyone who wants to be involved, but also at the same time have the leading names that we want to put in front of the media or, or help connect um, with, with other resources. So here we've got Andrew Miller. Um, he was an MP for 23 years before retiring recently, but for those last five years, from 2010 to 2015, he was the chair of the um, Parliamentary Science and Technology Select Committee. So he is now our chair at this preliminary stage. This is uh, Professor Dane, and brother now, um, recently a Dane. She was the chief scientific um, advisor to the um, European Commission President Barroso before that post was uh, knocked off recently and replaced with, with the panel. Uh, this is Professor Nick Butler. Um, he so set up, uh, co-founded with David Levant, um, the Centre for European Reform. He was special advisor to Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and he writes regularly in the Financial Times on um, global energy policies. Uh, this is Professor Sir Tom Blundell, President of the Science Council. This is uh, Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal, ex-president of the Royal Society. This is Lucy Thomas, one of the key figures in the Yes campaign, um, the, the main face of business from New Europe. She is a um, ex-BBC journalist and producer, mainly focused on Europe. And this is Lucy Shackleton, who's our link person with Universities UK. Her speciality is in European higher education. So you can see from that how we link through to the different uh, political, academic, and business interests and also the other campaigns 
that we've got going. So that's so that's what scientists for EU is now. Um, and I won't spend too long going on about my, my personal experience with the EU program now because Nerea sort of summarized it um, uh, there. But just to say my my first contact with the EU science program was trying to find EU grants online in 2004 and go absolutely mad. The websites were appalling. You went round in circles for days. You couldn't find if you were eligible to any of this funding. Um, and I thought I was I thought I was going mad until someone said, "Yeah, you, you can't possibly find it there. You have to call them up." And so then you called them up and you wait for ages. It was a complete mess. Um, then in 2009, um, I was in the Health Research for Europe project and uh, came to take it over in a sense um, as we changed course with it because initially it had been funded to find the best examples of European funded health research. Um, but then they didn't even give us the databases of all the projects funded and we had to threaten to sue them in order to get that. And then we found the databases to be a complete mess. Um, and so changed the whole analysis to be kind of like an economic model of what was funded. But then that led to, to various papers um, about what needs to be revised in the program. And a lot of these things have been revised. The budget has been uh, increased. The um, policy program, the whole structure of Horizon 2020 looks a lot more competent than what has gone before. And so there has really been uh, a shift, in my opinion, from like a bureaucracy to global leadership um, in terms of the science that the EU funds. Now, now coming to the sort of like the main meat of what has the EU ever done for UK science? Um, actually, on a Facebook page, we have, you know that Monty Python clip of kind of um, from Michael Bryan. What have the Romans ever done for us? Well, um, we we put that up on our page with kind of like uh, what has the EU ever done for us? And uh, and then a, a list from you know the, the clean air to the, to the workers' rights and um, and it's it's the same kind of dynamic because there is there is so much that has gone on um, and that all needs to come out in order to counter the, the negativity. But to go through the main points, science is absolutely vital to um, driving economies through um, education, through the high quality jobs, through knowledge economies, through the way research and innovation um, targets real societal problems and challenges like our health, like energy usage. Um, it also supports complex international collaborations that otherwise we just couldn't do. We'll come on to all of these one by one. ERC grants themselves are a global brand that has hugely benefited the UK because we're the top winner of those, bringing lots of talent to our shores through that. The freedom of movement principle itself, which the EU protects and stops governments like ours doing knee jerk reactions and cutting off uh, movement to people like, like they're doing with uh, non EU. Um, immigrants is, is absolutely vital um, to our ability to circulate people between labs and therefore connect labs and therefore put together better fusions and teams. And when you've got active stimulation of that through programs like the Mary Curie program and Erasmus Plus. Also, when you have this collective level of science programming, you can um, avoid reinventing the wheel in lots of different countries and actually set out what our common goals and challenges are and tackle those with large-scale projects. And also, the EU is now particularly good at linking businesses with um, <coughs> academia, which is actually something that, that really needs to, to happen. Um, and I'll get into why in just a sec. But investing in science, research and innovation is something that we now know absolutely to be a good idea for the economy. So it's not just uh, funding science isn't just about taking care of a few academics who want to study whatever they want to study. Um, it's been shown that investment in research and innovation has great return on that investment 
Um, and that's been well documented by the OECD, who recommended it strongly in response to the economic crisis. And you can flag up examples like South Korea or Finland. Um, but also, even our own um, Bank of England officials acknowledge that universities are a great counterbalance to the, um, the carousels of financial markets that took us into such woes. So, with that knowledge on board, how does our government respond? This, in red, is the investment, the public investment in scientific research as a percentage of GDP over time. And here is the UK at the bottom of the G8. Um, and what makes this sort of even more sort of distressing is that public investments in science leverages private investments in science um, reliably in a one to two ratio. So if you want to hit the 3% target overall, you need 1% um, investment to the public, and then that will be matched um, without you really doing anything um, by another 2% in private investment. And this is really important for stimulating a culture of investment in research and innovation, like you have in the States. Um, but it's, it's very dried up here comparatively. Now, what uh, and also, this is, this is remarkable when you're given that it's been shown time and time again that the UK um, punches above its weight in terms of science, in terms of the impact that comes from it. Studies of impact will show you that the UK is world leading. So, given that all, all that information that uh, we really do deliver the goods as it were for the economy, why are we starving out ourselves nationally? compared to all these other countries. What's the EU's response been? This is their investment in research and innovation. From program to program, it's, it's gone up dramatically. There are two lines here because this was the initial plan. This is what we've actually got. But nevertheless, it happened within a tightening budget. So the EU increased the science fund by 30% within a reduced budget. So FP7 um, was a uh, 55 million euro program, Horizon 2020, sorry, 55 billion euro program, Horizon 2020 is 80 billion. And I've, I've put that in terms of um, billions of euros per annum. Um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a famous um, and very popular American astrophysicist, has noticed that in terms of science growth, uh, the U.S. is actually losing out to Asia and Western Europe um, because they are starting to stagnate in their funding, just as we have been. But we are part of that envy growth, thanks to the EU, not thanks to Osborne and his, you know, personal declarations of his love for science and, you know, the ring fence in the science budget, which has actually just let it stagnate when it was already at a low level. So that's that. Now, uh, the next major benefit is the facilitating of these complex international collaborations. Um, so what you have in the EU is you have all these countries contributing to a common pot. From that, a subpot is drawn for research and innovation. That's the subpot that is growing, uh, while the um, uh, other parts of the pot, such as agricultural support, were reduced. And that allows multi-way collaborations in the same kind of style as the European Space Agency and, and CERN. Now, the ESA and CERN are international uh, collaborations, long-standing collaborations. Um, so governments agree that they're all going to pony up contributions for that, and then that gets revised on a regular basis. That's fine for a large-scale project, but if you want to do it, for thousands and thousands of smaller projects, which only have price tags of you know uh, one million to three million, or, or, or sometimes less, do you really want your governments to go and try and match up funds on each of those, especially if you have um, an eight-way collaboration across different countries? You get rid of a lot of bureaucracy of trying to do fund matching and trying to do negotiations like that. If you just agree on this common pot that is then uh, divided up according to um, commonly 
agreed um, global mission to what, what you want to fund. And this has been, this networking has been fantastically useful for the UK because now over 50% of the UK's papers are international. Um, the US is still on 35% with most of its papers domestic. Why is this important? Because it's been shown repeatedly that those papers that are international collaborations have a greater citation impact. Um, we won't go into why, but anyway, and then here uh, is just a picture I want to share with you. It was an analysis done by uh, Steve Smith, Professor Steve Smith, um, who we met before, and um, Jonathan Adams of um, Digital Science, previously in Nature. And, it, and it's the connectivity of all the scientific collaborations across the globe. And you'll notice that the real hub is Europe now, um, not America. And in fact, Europe's scientific output by the last count that I could find is 20% higher than America's, which shouldn't surprise you because population of 300 million, population of 500 million in the EU. Right, where are we? Right, and then, so we have from those funds that I mentioned before, um, lots of funds that, for the international uh, connectivity and collaborations. We also have the European Research Council grants, and this was something that was uh, pushed upon the EU Commission by leading scientists saying we would really like a program that sponsors um, completely investigative written research. You know, people can just come up with whatever ideas they want and put it before a panel, a, a council of scientists who judge it on its own merit. Um, and that started in 2007. It's been hugely successful. It's grown rapidly. Um, recently, the 5,000th award was given. Um, it has become certainly a Europe-wide brand, increasingly a global brand and universities all over Europe are keen to get in ERC grantees. Here in the UK, it's a complete gold star on your university if you can uh, get those ERC grants. Uh, because what we've got here um, is a capacity to attract excellent scientists from anywhere into the world into EU institutions. And the UK consistently hosts the most. And these, these are the most recent data UK leading in terms of number of grantees that it's bringing in in the life sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences. So we benefit strongly from this European level um, brand for excellent science. And then finally, let's skip through some other bits, which is uh, freedom of movement that I mentioned before, and I, I need to do the the background research in terms of people flow on Mary Curie and Erasmus, so we're still developing a lot of our evidence base, and there will be uh, organizations like the Royal Society and also CASE that, that will be developing their evidence base as well. Um, but certainly, it's not just a case of freedom for movement, but actually very much promoted freedom of movement for top talents around Europe, which means that here in the UK, we can get in some of the best uh, European scientists to teach our students and to work in our labs and then our students know that when they finish up they can go um, anywhere in Europe effortlessly and on some um, very reputable grants to work with whomever they want to work with. Um, another important aspect of the program which I alluded to before is that it's got a bold vision now um, looking at all of our common challenges. So rather than each country trying to reinvent the wheel and do things competitively with each other, we also have this collaborative layer, which is frankly a lot more inspiring than our, our current government's plans, which were based on uh, eight great technologies, and it wasn't so much of a thrilling read. Um, but um, I do think that the um, EU's Horizon 2020 program is very bold, it's very clear, it's based on um, promoting excellent science, including like that ERC program, um, industrial leadership, so really linking in the huge productivity of science with the productivity and research and innovation industry, and harnessing all of this 
to focus on our common societal challenges, whether they be transport, energy, health, environment. And these kind of things often need to be tackled on an international level. So it's the perfect vehicle for all of that. And like I mentioned uh, before, linking in um, businesses, large and small, is very important. With large businesses, you can help give them that innovative edge where it, it's too high risk for them to take on themselves, but then also gives your um, academics the training in the, in the real world of what's actually going on and make sure that they keep their research relevant. And in terms of small, innovative businesses, it helps all those um, spin-outs that really need um, the, the support network of the academic environment in, in order to, uh, rather than just being tossed out of the world of venture capitalists, which is a very different deal. And you should bear in mind that the Royal Society report found that less than 0.5% of people doing PhDs will actually go on to become tenured professors. Most people will leave at some stage. And so academia absolutely needs to be well integrated with business opportunities so that when your grants don't come through, you're not forced to walk the plank. You actually have contacts in an outside world um, so that you can work partially or completely um, in, in um, uh, the wide world. Now, what would happen if we did have a Brexit? Um, would we leave Horizon 2020 entirely? Um, or would we re-enter the program as an associated country buying into it uh, like Norway does, Switzerland does, Iceland does, and even Israel does? Well, I think if, um, let's say the referendum is held a year from now, and um, the no vote won, essentially we would probably continue on the Horizon 2020 program, not wanting to rock that vote. Uh, unless, of course, there are any kind of restrictions on freedom of movement, and we'll come on to the Swiss example in a second. Um, however, after Horizon 2020, um, getting into the next program that the, that the EU organizes would be a lot more tricky and would come down to a lot of negotiation because we've never had this circumstance before. And you certainly can't say we want to stay as kind of like 15 to 20 percent of all the, the winnings and the takings on this program, despite being 12 percent of the population and now outside the EU. There, there would be some tough renegotiations had, and we certainly wouldn't be in the driving seat as we are now. Um, leave, leaving Horizon 2020, I think, is, is nearly um, unthinkable, but um, there's certainly lots of stresses around the immigration issue, which could trigger massive problems like that. And I just want to address quickly the issue of, um, do we get more funds for science by leaving? Um, lots of people are aware that the UK is a net contributor year on year to the EU. And so um, some people have posited that, hey, if we pull out, then we've just got more funds to put into science. Yes, but it's not a zero sum game, as I've shown you with all the previous examples. The kind of science that we get out of the EU is absolutely complementary and additive uh, to what we do here. It's not just a case of boosting national funds. It really does add um, a layer that's irreplaceable. <clears throat> So, coming close to the end now, uh, I, I wrote this in the Guardian Science Blogs recently, and I talked to lots of Swiss uh, uh, people about this. What happened with Switzerland is that they had a referendum in February 2014, asking them whether they wanted to um, ditch freedom of movement and return to having immigration based on quotas, and also be able to preferentially give jobs to Swiss people over foreigners. And by the tiniest of margins, less than 1%, um, they said yes. And this threw their relationship with the EU science program uh, into a lot of turmoil because the Horizon 2020 contract was on 
the desk as this happened. And then that vote happened, and then there was another contract which was meant to be signed, allowing uh, Croatia into the whole freedom of movement and uh, collaboration game. And the Swiss government said, ah, oh, well, given the vote that we've just had, we're not sure we can sign that. And then the EU said, well, you know, given we can't sign that, we think you can't be part of Horizon 2020. And that immediately caused them huge problems because Switzerland had done well on the ERC grants as well. It had the Erasmus Plus program, um, which was then um, pulled away, and, and that's mobility of students. It had to fund its own end of the Erasmus Plus program itself, paying for students to go out and paying for students to come in, so double. So it did a lot of replacement programs and also temporarily renegotiated its way back in. But it was quite clear that um, a lot of damage has been done to Swiss science by um, not, not sharing the, you know, the, the open collaborative ethos and making that choice. So um, this is a strong warning for the UK because there were some in Switzerland who said, well, Israel um, is part of the program without having freedom of movement agreements with the EU. Can't we just do that? And it was basically decided by the Commission, well, no, that's a completely different scenario with a, with a country you know, far away. The, the rules for you are, are very different because we can't have your researchers moving freely throughout all of the EU, but ours being restricted from coming in. No, with your personal dynamic, we're saying no. And it's going to be the same thing with the UK. We don't have this automatic entitlement to become an associated country on exactly all of the same rules that we had before. It's something that's going to be renegotiated hard. And this program that we helped establish will now be in, or will then be, in the hands of other countries who are going to have to negotiate according to their own interests. Um, very briefly, let's talk about some damage already done. There has been reports commissioned by the government themselves about the balance of competences between the UK and the EU. One of those was science and innovation. And essentially, the report found um, that the EU is hugely beneficial to the UK in terms of research and development. Now, at the beginning of 2014, um, I was, we were all told that this document was going to come out at the end of the year. But then the floods came along, there was an announcement from Downing Street that no um, non-urgent documents should be released during the time of the floods. And then immediately after that, these series of documents were released during the time of the floods, and they were effectively buried in the news, and this caused a massive fuss. Another thing that you might want to know about the floods is there's a European fund for that. There's a European disaster fund for that. In 1997, the UK claimed millions and millions in support for when floods hit the UK then. This time round, they didn't. It's called the European Solidarity Fund or something like that. And the Conservative-led government didn't particularly like the sound of calling on EU help, especially under the name Solidarity. So they just did not pursue that money. Um, also, bizarre things are happening to non-EU um, immigrants. Here is the case of Dr. Uh, Miwa Hirono. I don't know if you know this story, but essentially she had a permanent post at the University of uh, Nottingham. She is an expert in um, international policy, Japanese, um, and so, you know, had, had her visas regularly renewed. But then, this year, in March, she was sent home by our home office. Why? Because there was a new rule that was set in 2012 saying that you can't be out of the country um, for more than 150 or 200 days a year um, unless there are exceptional reasons. And, were, and then they decided to apply this 2012 rule to her travel in 2009 and 2010, which had all been academic work. And it was all fully supported by the university. Um, but this retrospective um, application of laws to her was absolutely daft. Everyone was against it except the Home Office who insisted they were right. And they said, bye bye, me, we'll go home. No, this isn't your home. 
go home, back to Japan. And this caused massive furore. And um, it's it's something that, that is a message radiating out across the world. Um, uh, applications for visas from India has dropped off because it looks like, in, in, in science terms and in all terms, you know, the UK is now not open for business because we don't like foreigners. We've got problems with foreigners. We do not want this happening on the EU level as well, which is currently protected. Um, and, and quickly, just for some entertainment at the end here, this is what we're dealing with. Um, like th this correction from the sun, our 21st of October headline, Brussels, UK's 600,000 benefit tourists is no problem, was not accurate. There is no evidence of 600,000 benefit tourists in the UK, neither has the European Commission said this would be no problem. The sun has the highest editorial standards. But, you know, this is small clarification and correction in the back of a paper after they blast this across their headlines. Uh, and this is what a lot of the press have been doing for years. So no wonder people come on to our websites with comments like this. The EU propaganda machine will get into full swing soon. Um, enough, I detest the EU and that hateful flag, undemocratic, corrupt and not wanted. The new Nazis, and, and it gets in light, so I presume one of those was Liam Spence, who followed up with every aspect of British life needs to be given back to us, true British, because everything has come to a standstill since we entered the EU. And more and more kebab <laughs> shops have been taking over most of the shops that are for sale, instead of leaving them empty, I presume. Um, we are meant to keep it evolving into a better country each year, and this cannot happen if every other race are trying to change our ways. Like the white race never changed any other races by going into obliterating <laughs> populations in North America and Australia. Anyway, Phil also has something to say. I notice his banner is the EU flag. You know in the middle, so I guess his information is. I think NATO kept the peace, not the EU dictatorship, which seems hell-bent on starting World War III. I, I, I can only guess if that's the Ukraine reference. Um, right, we've got some more. Um, the Great Deception. Uh, criminals, subsidy suckers, and academic prostitutes, which I presume is all of us here. Um, the consumers of our wealth want the EU. Um, John decides to chip in. Uh, receiving payments from a foreign power to terminate the sovereignty of the UK has a name. Dot, 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 dot. Um, so evidently, um, yes, we're, we're, we're all treasonous, and I guess David Cameron would be in that bracket then as well. Okay. Um, this guy um, is, is one of the, the, the new uh, left-wingers who decides to take the attitude of, like Greece, uh, TTIP shows what the EU has become. Okay? And this is actually a, something that we really need to strongly address. The, the Greek situation is serious and, um, and it is complex, but in terms of science, it's absolutely clear from the, the Greek colleagues I've talked to, the analyses they've given back to me, is that Greek science has been largely preserved by EU membership during years of very bad political turmoil and mismanagement in some of their institutions. Peter is another issue. Um, this guy decides to target me personally. This body is run by Mike Goldsworthy. His entire career is being funded by the EU. <laughs> what does that mean? That I've got part access to 80 billion euros. And then, yes, all those laws from the EU, unbiased, Actually, scientists for the EU get no money um, from the EU or from anyone at the moment. Um, and, um, but this argument of um, the uh, UK universities receiving funds from the EU is a repeating theme. But it's very important to point out that in, in these universities here, we get funds from the EU and the UK. And so we're in a perfect position to actually 
compare, do a case control study, see if there's any additive value in the EU funds. And if not, then we're in the perfect position to say, hey government, you know, we don't need to be working with the EU, you don't need the funds going through a middleman, we'd rather have it directly. But the situation is that pretty much all the vice chancellors of the universities are pro-EU, and the past, present, and future incoming presidents of the Royal Society are all pro-EU. So we are perfectly placed in order to evaluate the utility of that program. But who believes scientists anyway? Scientists do not live in the real world anyway. That's why so many of them were happy to work for Hitler. He gave them facilities so they did not question his motives so long as they could pursue their research. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so please, please, please do um, follow us on, on Facebook um, and Twitter, and um, we're, we're open for business for conversation with anyone about you know, how to promote this and drive this forward because obviously it's a community uh, a drive on everyone's part who, who cares about being. Um, you know, in a system where we can collaborate and share for the common good. Um, we need to approach it in, in uh, various levels. First of all, we need to make sure that the entire science community knows that we're here and we're a collecting point for the ideas and the evidence and a facilitator for them to be um, holding talks and debates whether they want to be hosting those or speaking at those. So, so gathering that voice. Secondly, it's been important to integrate into the Yes campaign so that they all know what we're about and what we can represent and the importance of science to the economy. It's not just about making better trade deals, trying to make better trade deals, okay? Um, and then, with, with those in place, um, we have, through the General Yes campaign, more facilitating mechanisms to make the videos or write the articles in um, papers that are read more broadly or get involved in the debates that, that happen um, at universities, at public venues, on radio, on television, etc., etc. Um, so, so that's that's the progression. But first of all, we are we are shoring up our community, shoring up our arguments, and making sure that that is all a strong part of the overall yes campaign. Because science really is um, fundamental to the economy. It's, it's fundamental to the future direction of where we want to go as humanity. Trade is important, but yes, I was brushing your teeth twice a day. Um, it's not an existential thing about, about where we're going on this planet and, and the problems that we need to crack in order to make life better for all of us. Thank you very much. I completely agree with your conclusion. Uh, I think it would be best for the, Europe, uh, for, uh, the UK to stay in the EU. But my strong feeling, actually, since Greece and all of what happened up to the night is indeed that not not everything is perfect within the European Union. I think we can probably all agree that really nothing is perfect. But so I think there are also things that might be less related to science, but all since all scientists are also humans and citizens of the European Union, I think we have to also address at least in the campaign issues like austerity, issues like the European Union, especially at the moment the very uh, strong influence of Germany actually driving a specific political view within the union that needs for example to something 
like bailing out banks, but not so much maybe even giving giving debt relief to countries, leading to 50% uh, youth unemployment in Spain, for example. Things like that. I think I think we shouldn't in the campaign neglect those, and we shouldn't run a yes campaign that says everything is beautiful and all the arguments against it are basically funny and troll and of course they're all trolls. But you know, there are some some grains in here are actually things we should address because think if we don't do that in the yes campaign. Yep. Then we're actually hitting a wall because then nobody takes it seriously if we start to say everything is fine. Just wanted to, to raise that point that there are there are, there's a multi positive problem, right? We have to break it down so we can have the easiest message. But then I, I hope that the company will not make it too easy and get the message too bad one festival. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, your your spot on. Um, it's it's in a balancing act. For example, um, there's going to be lots of people slagging off the EU, and you can spend all of your time getting drawn into those debates, and it's just going to sound like a, a headache, and then people will just want to pull out of everything at the end of that. Um, but at the other extreme, you could ignore all those problems and talk about all the good stuff, and then just poo poo that, but then people know those problems are real too. So it's getting the balance right. I think the main overarching message is that. Um, you have to be in it to help make the difference. Pulling out the EU is going to do nothing to help Greece. Okay. Um, in terms of helping Greece, I actually have um, a, a piece coming out in five days' time in Research Europe, where I, with Professor Martin McGee, who's the president of the European Public Health Association, uh, have written a proposed uh, research and innovation in health and rescue package for Greece. Uh, Greece has really benefited from EU membership. Um, in terms of its, its science capacity, because it's had all these grants coming inside, it doesn't come down from political management. In fact, the, the, the Greek government actually tried to extract all the money from the, the Greek universities and research centers, um, saying that it needed to pay off the, the IMF, and the director said, no, no, you can't do it. This is EU money for grants that we are dedicated, have you know, legal bindings in order to fulfill can't touch that. Imagine if it, there hadn't been part of that community and they were just they were just being sucked dry and the brain drain would have been even more drastic than it is now. But we do, as a European community, need not uh, need to actually get involved rather than saying, oh no, look at how they've been treated, I'm going to pull out. I think no, um, there's a lot of goodwill towards um, Greece, you know, understanding of their predicament. Um, and even within the German population, it's really, really divided. Some people think their leadership should be punished, they should be sucking money from us, others are, are distraught at how you know, Germany is being portrayed because they want to help their common Europeans. The Greeks themselves you know, said, we don't want to leave the Euro, uh, and we don't want to leave the EU. Uh, you know, we want help, we want it to be you know, fixed. Um, so, of course, in the, in the 28 country block is going to have some problems. Um, but I think that it's um, a lot of times a, a, a people think against what we increasingly recognize to be uh, dark mechanisms that we must take on. And I think we're, we're best doing that on the collective level. Same thing with TTIP, really. I mean, they, there's lots of complaints about it still, but at least ISDS has been dropped out of that. Um, at least we've got to that stage. This is a mechanism that has been through all the international trade deals until now without anyone noticing. And part of the argument was, oh, this is what we stand put in trade deals. If we don't like it, we contribute. Don't worry, we've never used it, but we just like it in there. Um, but now that's been dropped out. If we weren't part of the EU, would we have made trade deals with America, which had that included effortlessly and gone through so quickly and, um, and nimbly that we would have had no opportunity to stop it? I don't know either way, but I think that's an argument worth putting out there. And I think we've actually done a really good job as a people across Europe at putting this on the tables of our MEPs and saying we're not letting this one go. I think that it's a demonstration of how the European people have really wrapped their MPs over big business interests, which presume that they could just walk through without including us, the public, in those conversations, which is obviously wrong. Uh, 
Uh, I should declare an interest. I'm a member of the executive of the European Movement. Um, you've made a very compelling case for why science is uh, Europe is important to science. Yeah. Um, but I think the other part of the case is essential to non-scientists, and that is uh, why science is important to Britain. Yeah. And you talked about some of the economic benefits. Yeah. But there's one subject I, I may have missed it, but I don't think touched on it, which I think is the most important science-based issue for most citizens, and that's climate change. We have floods at the end, yeah. but um, there's a huge number of people who need to know the role that the European Union has played in yes. fighting climate change. Yeah. Absolutely, and compare again uh, the EU to America on this. America recently had a vote in the Senate finding that climate change was not man-made. It was 50 to 49, and um, a close analysts of this vote have actually said that a lot of those people that voted to say that it wasn't man-made, she knew full well it was, but they are in the pockets of, of big industry and big business. America has got a huge problem with the, the, the industrial corruption on that political layer, and much you want to complain about the EU, at least in terms of this particular issue, they have been very proactive um, in, in all the right ways, and I, and I think most of the public across Europe would absolutely agree with that. My, thank you very much for having a talk. My question is related to this future referendum. It's true that the European Union citizens that we are here, we can vote, that I think that this is against the European Union uh, treatment, and it's true that the expat, British expat, can vote in the referendum that I suppose that this is against the British uh, law. I uh, this this is where my knowledge falls apart because I've just not had time to keep up with, with those. Because so there are some comments about the organization of this referendum that are it's the same for as the general election, right? Mm -hmm. Except not the same as the general election. So Commonwealth citizens will be yeah. Again. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mean the, the, the No campaign um, wants anyone who's touched the EU in, in any way um, not eligible to vote. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was even, uh, and, and I'm not kidding you, um, even, even though this came out on April the 1st, uh, as many news stories, it actually wasn't um, an April Fool's joke. Um, but UKIP um, did a, a press release saying that one of the reasons why they didn't want the 16 and 17 year olds voting uh, was because in schools uh, there have been um, pro-EU sentiments expressed, such as the colouring books given to children that uh, feature the common agricultural policy. And there's, there's more I have to say. This is possible about that. It's possible to sustain this point in a, in a legal point of view in the parliament? Uh, well, no, I mean, every, every, everyone dismissed that as being, being clearly nuts. But also in the same, in the same uh, package, they also said, you know, scientists and universities were, were polluted as well um, by um, having all the EU research grants, um, which, which is a daft point of view um, to think that, that that if you've, if you've got any experience in the EU, that disqualifies you from knowing anything about the EU. Could, could I add something about who can vote? Yeah. Because there were there's three categories of people who can't vote, who people are arguing should be able to vote. There's other, other European citizens living in Britain. There's British citizens living in other parts of Europe. And then the 16 and 17 year olds. And I expect to see amendments in the House of Lords on all three of those. But I think the only one that really has a chance of actually getting through Parliament is the 16 and 17 year olds. I think that one has a chance, but the others I think will be defeated. Uh, Nevertheless, those communities are very entitled to make a fuss. Yeah. Um, and I think they should. Um, what, what, what one guy said to me um, uh, recently, is, um, a couple of days back, is he said, you know, on the eve of the referendum, I would love to see uh, people in the capital cities all across um, Europe waving uh, British flags. He said, yeah, that kind of love bombing. You, you look very mean to be, you know, voting against that. Especially for head of campaign, 
based on all the good that the EU has provided to the UK and can provide. Um, there's lots of extraordinary uh, benefits that have come through, whether it be environment, whether it be um, in terms of all the great academic projects that we've done that benefit citizenry. And there are lots and lots of business examples as well. So I think the main thing is to get out all of those stories because that, that uh, is, is, I think, a very good counterbalance to um, some of the negativity that we have. Uh, yeah, you've been talking about the, you know, uh, how many funds we are able to get in, in the UK from, from Europe. Yeah. And also that, that the UK is able to attract researchers from, from Europe to the UK. Uh, that could change or not because you, know, you, you are also able to, to participate. As you said, UK will be able to participate as a third country, but what happen with what will happen? What do you think will happen with European scientists like the most of us because we represent a community of the Spanish scientists in the UK? That means that we are European and we work in UK. And the one of the most important uh, points is that we have the war permit. Yep. We have the right to stay and live and work here because we are European citizens. And and I don't know the percentage, but we are a lot of European researchers currently working in the UK. What will happen with, with us? I mean, essentially, if if there is a no vote, that's a big moment beyond which we don't quite know what will happen because there are people in the no campaign who absolutely believe in freedom of movement. They just don't want, you know, all, all the laws and the repression of our sovereignty. But they believe in freedom of movement. But there are a lot of voters that they are courting that absolutely want to shut down all immigration. So if there is a no vote, and then people say, oh, we've had a no vote, but now we're, we're going to maintain uh, freedom of movement, a lot of that population say, then what did we vote for? And they will want restrictions on immigration. And then if that comes in, then that puts you all in a more difficult boat because you could be in me or one of those boats where you just get, you know, kicked out for God knows what random reasons. Um, and then that jeopardizes also um, our, our science program, as you can see in the, in the case with Switzerland. So, um, yeah, there are real dangers. Because, I mean, I would like to know how many foreigners are working in Brussels in the UK because of my personal view. Without any number, yes. is that British science is well, run by foreigners. Yeah. Um, well, well, someone actually run by, but someone actually did um, uh, post up. Uh, well, I mean, your your, your chancellor um, is um, no, your vice chancellor um, is um, Polish, isn't he? Um, and also the the new Crick Centre. I think that is productive. I think that's more foreigners than Brits, because I saw a pie chart of that once. But yeah, it's an important point to make. I haven't had the personal capacity to gather all that data yet. So anyone who wants to help me on, on data gathering and an evidence-based gathering is, is hugely, um, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how much I can collaborate with the Royal Society in case on that, because that might have to be independent, because Otherwise, that wouldn't look good for them. But yes, we, we do need more person power on on on, on bringing in all of, all of that evidence to make these points. Uh, uh, yeah. So something that really strikes me is that one of the issues of the referendum is immigration. Yeah. And many of the people against you, British people against you, they are really against all these foreigners. So if the UK really goes out of the EU, then I guess many of the foreigners would have to go back home. And these people really don't realize that the country needs them. Because if they leave, British itself is not going to have enough people to cover all the jobs. And I see like a kind of a collapse on them. So is people really aware of things? We need to make more of these things. 
Uh, I mean, there are also lots of British people in other countries around Europe who are equally worried as well, what's going to happen to us? Uh, and so I think these personal stories are very important. And so when you hear people like that, they will have to talk about it. We should be doing trade deals independently like Switzerland does. Just think, yeah, you know, is this really what it's about? So going back to the to what uh, Eduardo said, uh, so what I have heard uh, in the news, I think it was uh, I don't know if it was Cameron saying that if the UK go up, goes out of uh, the European Union, they are going to put uh, a limit in the salary that you have to a minimum of salary that you have to earn uh, to stay in the UK as a foreigner, and it was thirty thousand pounds. So for those of you who aren't scientists, well, not even a postdoc earns that at the beginning of their yeah. postdoctoral state. So not even PhD students would, would be able to come and do their PhD here. Plus, the, the thing is that, uh, going back to what you said, you don't have the numbers about, actually, I was talking with my English colleagues yesterday about this, and actually, they, we were wondering, OK, if the UK goes out of the European Union, how many people are going to be in this building? <laughs> we were counting, and we could count it with my fingers. So uh, I can say that 80% uh, of the institute, 85% of the, my institute yeah. is foreigners. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, I mean, it's been shown by analysis that the EU migrants, uh, for every pound they cost, I think it's they return in taxes one pound thirty-five. That that's been a thorough analysis. Whereas, uh, you know, and after we just went through economic hardship as well, it was quite clear that immigrant influx really helped to keep the economy afloat. So, in terms of potential economic collapse, yeah, there, there is certainly a threat there. And also, I think on moral grounds, I don't like this cut off of. If, if you earn so much, you can come really? in, otherwise you go <laughs> From away. It's kind of like, so freedom of movement for the rich. Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, because we don't like poor people moving around and traveling and settling in that. I don't even like it when I see it happen between cities and villages. They, they should have permits and proof that they can earn money before they're even allowed to get on trains. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> uh, I, 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 think, I think it's mean-spirited. Um, I think it's just trying to um, extract um, money from, from talent abroad, and I think it will be seen as such, and I think it's ultimately um, killing the goose that lays the dog. And it's also, I think, the UK would lose the capacity of, attract, of attracting those yeah. scientists. So it's not only about not getting all those grants that are European grants, it's about, if I may, if I'm, it was in Spain and the UK was out of the European Union, I would say, What's the point of going there if I'm not going to be able to apply to all these fellowships and I have to, to ask for a visa and ah oh, let's go to Germany that's that's easier and well, let's or let's go to France. For two years, and you think what happens after that? I don't want to take that risk. Uh, and I have to say that I'm very happy to live in this country, but of course I would be happy doing science in Spain, but I can't right now. So I'm glad that there is uh, that the UK lets me let yeah. me uh, be here and do my job, right, and develop my career. And I yeah. think. And the, the thing is that what I don't, I don't think people realize, some people realize, is that my education, I, I came here after my PhD, my education was paid by the Spain. Exactly. Uh, and yeah. by European uh, money. When so there is brain you're getting brain. the benefits. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know your value like that, as you should know, and that's also something that we, as the British science community, should be supporting because we have so much value here. It's brilliant. And we also value the opportunity to make contact with all of you and know about what, what's going on in different labs in different countries. And so that opens us a uh, chance for us to go and work in different countries as well. Should we find partners there or just find that we, we love it there in terms of the whole culture or there's a particular lab or professor that we want to work with? You know, all, all of that, that richness back and forth um, is something that, yes, benefits may be written more if that's where the flow is going, but ultimately, you should try and make it more of a circulation, a 
that would have in balance like that, and that's what a lot of regional development funds are aimed at doing. And then it's a benefit to everyone, it's a benefit to the whole ecosystem, and that and that shouldn't be shut down by um, uh, mean spirited trying to just extract the best talent from other people's countries. And um, with, with that kind of mentality, I, I really don't buy into that. I don't think that's what we're talking about. Um, so I'm the younger of the movement, so thank you for the uh, brief mention in your presentation, Shukai. Um, I wanted to raise the question of science students, because um, looking at political youth organisations, it's basically scientists who are among the least engaged of all students, because really? they're doing work and they just don't have time for politics, that is just an option, science so answer. It's always nice when we do have a scientist that are totally shining an example and they're always figured. Um, but I was wondering if you had um, science students within your remit of the science community are open to target. I also if you have any concrete ideas on how you want to do that. And I think we can both work together as well. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I've, I've talked to uh, Bettina about this. Um, so, um, and I also connected her with, with Alistair Jarvis of Universities UK for the specific plan of whenever there are talks going in at universities around the country, um, universities UK should have this event list and they should be sharing it with you guys so that you can be there with stalls to say do you want to join up young European movement and then get information about what's going on in some of these events so that you can you know support the pro-EU movement and, and all of your Spanish and other colleagues that that, that need to um, you know be appreciated and have that shown by by the, by the science community public and, and, and the academic uh, community in general. I think that really needs to happen, you know, that demonstration of we understand that. And yes, I'm more than happy to uh, to keep those units going, come along and talk, or, or get speakers in that are appropriate for whatever talks they are. A lot of what we're going to do is going to be trying to get uh, potential hosts matched up with potential speakers um, so that, that uh, we were organizing a lot of events to share this kind of information. Yeah, I, I would like to mention another point. Not directly related to the EU is this uh, Teresa May idea that the international students in our universities here in UK now are considered immigrants. <coughs> and this is a fantastic business, business for this country huh? because these students are First, paying an average of £12,000 per, per year, uh, accommodation, they spend money. Yeah. They are coming from around the world. In my university, for example, we have a student, international student from more than 140 different countries. And this is a, you know, a fantastic business for this country, but this toy uh, idea about anything that is not from here is not uh, well connected that will, will be really very detrimental for the higher education, of course, and for the uh, development of the science and the economy. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there is a right-wing idea which is not about our, our community altogether. It, it's about um, money making and money extraction. And um, uh, Daniel Hernan who uh, wrote a piece in The Telegraph saying that um, freed from Euro chains, uh, universities could be claiming whatever they fees they like from all students, including European students, because we have the best universities in the world. Um, but all of our universities want to keep the system like as it is and our relationship with Europe as it is. Um, of course, they are to a degree money-making enterprises, but um, we've got a really good deal at the moment and we don't want to spoil what we've got. Um, I, I don't subscribe to those kind of exploitative um, ideas. So can I just uh, say something? I don't know if it's correct what I'm trying to say, but from the slides it looks like there are quite important and all the equal important here of scientists who you care like this Do you think it would be important to include foreigners as well or do you want to keep it like UK people Trying to give a message to other people. Yeah, good question. I haven't thought about that actually. Um, in, in terms of our advisory board, it was pretty much shaped up 
kind of along the lines of who do we know and who can tick sort of what boxes in terms of their, their links through to, to industry, to academia, to political, to the other campaigns. Um, certainly, um, and so, so, so they're, they're, they're almost kind of like a bit of a power play as well to, to show people, you know, the serious things we've got on board. Uh, I think it is important to connect with um, the, the foreign scientists working here, but maybe the community level is a more important way to do that. Just having a figurehead, I mean, it, it was initially a grassroots thing, um, and we, um, the science community is international anyway, that's what it is. So it's, it's, it's us here, us over there, and then you are the Europeans, you know, over there and here, and all mixed up. And that's how it should be in all apps. Um, so uh, on that community level, um, I, think, I think we certainly want that, that strong voice of representation within our mix as we put that message out and, and giving voice to whoever wants to speak on that particular issue. So I have a question for you, and this is more like, what is, going, what is your personal view of if it's going to be a Brexit or not? Especially now that we have like all these people left voices coming from the whole Well, um, I think it's very fair to say that we absolutely don't know. Um, you would, uh, in terms of the bookies, uh, if you wanted to put money down on it, um, it would look more likely that we would stay in, um, I think there will be some very strong voices coming out, like Barack Obama did, in order to say, don't, don't think you can drop the EU, go global, and, and we'll think that's cool, because it's, it's got all the wrong motivations behind it. Um, but I don't want to see any complacency whatsoever on that front, because just before the whole Greek thing kicked off, um, the um, pro-EU sentiment of the British public was kind of like a, an all-time high by some polls. And then since Greece happened, I think I, I saw one poll midway, and I think now it's going to look quite disastrous. Um, and um, and, those, and, and Greece, the Greek situation isn't finished either, not by a long way. I mean, if there's a big health crisis there, it's quite possible, then things could all start to break down, or if they don't pass through some of the reforms that are foisted upon them, um, then, and that blows up as well, or the government forms, then it could be the EU dictatorship crush that government and made it fall. How democratic is that? You know, there, there are lots of bad things that could happen. Um, so they're making predictions is, is not what I want to do. I just want to see what happens. Actually, let's see what happens. Yeah. So are there any other questions? So join me and thank Mike for the reason of the talk.